one side wins, the Christians are going to get kicked out. If the other side wins, the Christians still get kicked out, right? You see the Jews in the, I don't know if you've seen the videos where the Jews in Israel, they would spit on Christian like pilgrims who go there and check it out. And the Muslims, they're also not going to preserve any churches. They're just, they're going to destroy the churches too. Like both sides are just trying to get Christianity out of that region of the world. The Johannin logos, the logos depicted in the Gospel of John, is eternally, mm -hmm. is, is constant, not eternally, but constantly expelled from society. <laughs> Today we have a returning guest. This is a gentleman who has been talking about mimetic theory in different ways on Twitter, especially. He goes by the name Q. His Twitter page is called Mimetic Value, which uh, promises pragmatic applications of mimetic theory. And um, he says, all thoughts robbed from your favorite gurus. So um, that's the way you have to be when you're looking at mimetic theory is realizing how superfluous our own claims on ideas really are. So welcome to the program, Q. How you doing? Uh, thank you. Yeah, it's good to be back. Now, can you disclose where you are right now? Or are you in a, in a hidden spot officially? Yeah, I'm hidden somewhere. <laughs> yeah. You're not at the White House, though, right? Um, Maybe. Well, you know, we wanted to have you on because you've been exploring some ideas that I thought would be interesting to share with our audience, which is your journey. You know, you've been studying mimetic theory. And at first, I think you were kind of using, you know, using most of your insights gleaned from it to kind of make a pragmatic uh, exploration through, you know, how to how to run business and how to, you know, think about advertising and psychology and relationships. Right. Kind of a practical utilitarian use of mimetic mm -hmm. theory. Uh, you kind of tabled the the spiritual theological side for a little bit, right? And and you you kind of tabled that. Said, well, I think it's something about monotheism, and that's good enough, right? And then mm -hmm. and then you kind of started rethinking that 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 kind of approach. You started diving a little bit deeper into the spiritual claims that Gerard said are inevitable to come upon mm -hmm. once you really fully understand that the, the highest truth in the medic theory is actually getting at always ends up pointing to the claims of Christianity and the incarnational reality of Christ as both son of man and son of God. Right. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about, you know, you started off kind of, I like the way you, you situated it as we were talking before the show about, you know, mm -hmm. kind of how you encapsulated the 10th commandment and the first commandment that you find in the 10 commandments. Yeah, so so basic. Actually, I kind of want to go even further back than that, right? Sure. So how I kind of came across religion in the first place, which is, um, like I was exposed to a lot of like Christianity and the atheist scientific type of stuff growing up, and then like I never really fully bought into atheism, right? Because like all these like nerdy kids at school who are also at the top of class with me, they are always saying how they, smart they are because they're atheists. And although at that time, I would say I was not like fully believing in Christianity, I still used like Christian arguments against them by saying like, how can you say that your worldview is necessarily correct? You have some sort of belief in something unprovable, right? And then basically around like 2014 to 2016, around like right before Trump got elected, I was when I was reading people like Nassim Taleb and Shastov and Gerard. That was when I first started reading them. And Shastov is one of these characters. He's kind of like this guy who came after Nietzsche and Kierkegaard and uh Dostoevsky and combine their ideas and his central idea is that all things are possible and what he says is that basically you need to take a leap of faith 
to go beyond this mechanical view of the universe where you kind of all because all these atheists ultimately they're scared basically Shestov just called some cow words and said you're afraid to drop this rigid framework of what you think reality is and it's only through miracles where you break out of that and say look god is above what you consider to be necessary to this world and yeah he calls it necessity right so he says god is above necessity that's why he can do the impossible therefore that's the miracle and therefore all things are possible so that's what really kind of convinced me that yeah there's no way atheism is true so that left you with going to what monotheism right there or you went to something else not not yet right because then it's like all these like people who are into tech startups and whatever they're all like oh let's do meditation meditation is really cool i'm like all right and because they say you don't have to believe anything you just observe your mind sure. now how were like, you right. influenced by the tech people were you living in that area or just following their content online um, mostly following their content online, right? Because back then I was already kind of anti-mimetic. I was in a, going to school in Boston. I had to leave that environment. I was like, this is just everyone doing the same thing, making the next Facebook for dog owners only or something. This is bullshit. And then I heard like San Francisco is the tech capital. I'm like, okay, that's the place I would definitely never go to because that's where everyone's just going to have the same ideas over and over again and just like jerk each other off. So I went to Omaha instead and just did my own readings for, for a bit. So that and was kind of like, that was, was that, that was like your uh, self-imposed exile away from the mimetic culture, right? You went over to Omaha yeah, and uh, you, you mm -hmm. were, that's like if Paul was going to Arabia to, to think about the contemplate reality, you went to Nebraska, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly right what, right what so was that like in one word describe nebraska as an experience what would you say um i would say it's it's good not not yeah. bad but not not like super fun but also it was it was necessary to get away from the east coast yeah yeah so basically i was reading gerard at the same time i was exploring the buddhist ways of how they think about desire and like it was very obvious that Gerard was discussing something that they have never considered, right? Because the Buddhists, they say, oh, you just meditate away your desires. Or that's like the mainstream sect of them, right? They also have a more crazier sect called Vajrayana where they say, hey, why don't you just explore your desires and try to somehow give into your desires, yet somehow reach... Uh, enlightenment that way but then when you look at all the Vajrayana gurus what happened is they just formed all these sex cults and there's all sorts of insane scandals and like when you read Gerard it's like very obvious he understood the true nature of desire way more than any of these Buddhists right like I would say like meditation is fine right like if you're just like sitting there having some quiet time but that's like I don't think it's true in that they all say, oh, if you just sit there and meditate, you'll arrive at the Buddhist conclusions. I think that's actually just not true. That's part of their dogma. Mm -hmm. And and what I saw when I was meditating is actually, no, the Gerardian view is way more true, right? How, all right now we can get, hmm, what's that? How is it more true when you were meditating? Because it's like your desires, they're imitated from other people, right? Like you... Yeah, sure, you can just, like, sit there alone and just, like, forget your desires for a bit. Okay, I guess you're just falling asleep or whatever. But, like, as soon as you return to the world and interact with others, I guess having, like, that practice awareness to kind of helps in recognizing when you're mimicking other people's desires. But if you just go by the Buddhist type of framework, it's not sufficient. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I, I, you, there was somebody that you retweeted named Hyde that says people still don't get it. Mystical and spiritual traditions emerge as a counterweight to the dominant culture. Everyone who's been to Asia knows what a chaotic and loud place it is. It makes sense that their traditions are couched in stillness and contemplation. They don't represent the psyche of the average person there. Mm -hmm. Another commenter said, not sure about this. Westerners have come up with their own sanitized versions of Eastern spiritual traditions. It's us that think 
their traditions are couched in stillness and contemplation when in practice they aren't. Uh, Thai Buddhists still don't really meditate. So wh where did you, where do you side on that discussion here? Uh, yeah. So, so I think Hyde is kind of like indirectly pointing at mimetic desires, right? Because like these Buddhists who are the, the monks, they have like a partial intuition about mimetic desire. That's why they're trying to escape that mimetic world where everyone's just chaotic, copying everyone's desires. But they have not really found Christ. They have not found like the full, like complete view of how to deal with their problems. Because the idea, the difference between the Christian problem, the Christian approach to desire versus those approaches is that they don't have a mechanism by which to orient desire in a positive direction. They just try to turn off the desire machine in some kind of neutral status, which is just almost impossible, right? You can't really do that. Um, you yeah. got, well, you they either say that, desire. right, right. They either say that or they say to just give in to your desires and see what happens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But some some Christian uh, people have tried to suggest similar things like that too, you know, mm -hmm. well, like testing the bounds of grace or something, so that you can understand the futility of your sin, which I think is probably a bad idea. <clears throat> yeah. sure. mm -hmm. Um. So you so you uh, you explored the Eastern traditions, and then you where did you go from there? You started getting into monotheism there, or no, not yet. Yeah, because that was the same time I was reading Gerard, right, and. I was already pretty convinced that Gerard was right. However, it's, you know, like Jesus said he's the way, right? He's the on, one true way, right? However, at that time, I was still looking at a lot of this like perennialist, pluralist type of stuff. It's like, okay, yeah, I can validate that Jesus is one true way, but I can't prove that he's the only true way yet, right? Yeah. And that's when I was like, that's why I basically looked at Gerard's writings regarding the Ten Commandments and concluded that, okay, for sure, monotheism has to be the way, but I can't narrow it down. I Well, I haven't narrowed it down to beyond that at that point yet, right? So, mm -hmm. so Gerard's analysis of the uh, Ten Commandments basically... Let me try to summarize it, which was what we were trying to talk about in the first place at the very start, is that the Ten Commandments, it's actually kind of, you can converge them into one commandment, basically. Because, like, the first commandment and the Tenth Commandment are the kind of like two sides of the same coin where you look at a big picture problem. And then the yeah. ones in the middle are just kind of details that tell people in a more concrete way this is what will happen if you don't follow the first and the 10th commandment. Right. Right. So for example, like murder, adultery or whatever, it's like, yeah, that's all results of this mimetic conflict. Right. And when you look at the 10th commandment, it says you can't covet your neighbor's goods, right? That's a prohibition on mimetic desire because the issue that comes up is that if you covet what's your neighbor's, then you inevitably make your neighbor into your mimetic model and you start to idolize them and then you break the first commandment. Right. Um, it's uh, kind of chiastically arranged, isn't it? The way they, it, it kind of, it, it folds in on itself. Mm -hmm. The way you start off with uh, the first commandment and then you get into the the final commandment, and they're kind of the same thing. And then you you know you have um, you know you shall have no other gods before me, and then you you shall not covet, right? Same thing, mm -hmm. different way of looking at it, right? Yeah. Then you have you shall not make idols, um, and then you say you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Mm -hmm. See, I'm saying I'm taking the I'm taking the chiastic structure, the first one, and then going to the last one, then the second one, then going to the second to last, right? Just like a chiastic, chiastic. Yeah. Um. And so it's interesting to just think about all of this in a chiastic structure that the 
the vertical, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the theological, right? Mm -hmm. And then the anthropological is you shall not covet. Mm -hmm. And the anthropology and the theology kind of intertwine together, don't they? Right there. Right, right. And that's the mind blown part. And right. and the thing is, like, after I read that, I thought, all right, I'm just going to stop here for a while. And and when I stopped there, I just kind of assumed that all the monotheists know this. I was basically under the impressions that the Jews and the Muslims know this. But now I think, actually, they don't understand this. Wow. So co continue on with where your journey is. I'm, I'm just... Uh... Mm -hmm listening here this is interesting yeah yeah so basically i got to this point and that's when i started to hear more about islam right and then at that point obviously i heard of the term islam before but i didn't really know what it was about and they say that they are just trying to follow the path of all the old prophets all the old testament prophets and jesus and and they think that god has sent this message of mo pure monotheism to every culture throughout time. And I thought, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And, and what they say is that the, all you have to do is just follow pure monotheism, believe that there's only one true God. And to me, right. I didn't really see a major conflict with Christianity. I said, all right, cool. They're, they seem to be this kind of like a, protestant sect from that kind of and pretty much like a original protest reformation from the six six hundreds ad that's kind of how i thought about it yeah and i think superficially that is how it would appear to a christian right if you don't know much about the details of what they really believe and i think that's kind of like a trap of how they trap christians into converting to islam but it's not a true conversion what do you think is the appeal that they they rely on to get Christians to convert to Islam? Um, I, I think it's the appeal is that they acknowledge Jesus as the Messiah. Now, like now, after digging further, I realize like they do not mean it in the same way as us. But like originally, it's like okay, they recognize him as the Messiah. So you're kind of under certain assumptions, like you assume they believe certain things when they actually don't. And not only that, it's like. To me, it was also appealing that they said they sent prophets to like every culture and stuff. It's like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. It's like, if there is one true God, of course, like people everywhere in the world should be able to arrive at that conclusion. Sure. And if that's all you need to believe, yeah, that just kind of links back to the Ten Commandments. So to me, that system made sense in that way, right? However... If you actually dig deeper into what they really believe, you start to find all sorts of insane contradictions. And it just reveals like that they don't actually understand the Old or New Testament to a deep level, right? They're basically just like paying lip service to the Old Testament prophets and Jesus, but they don't actually understand their true message at all. Right. Right. And mm -hmm. So when you look at the, um, the 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 folks who are saying, "Look, Islam provides a lot more order. Look at all the Christian dominant societies. They're exploring. They're all locked up in nihilism and decadence. And wh how do you how do you address that that apparent uh, difference there? Let you see. Yeah. So like the funny thing is like, even when I was like more interested in Islam, like. I would not cons I never really bought into that argument. Cause like if you look at history, right, like there's gonna be rise and falls of different cultures and civilizations. Like that doesn't really mean anything about God in the long term, who's like infinite, right? Like the timeline is infinite. While if you look at things going wrong in society right now, it's only like a few decades or maybe you can make the argument for a few hundred years but it's not the permanent thing right right um so 
let's explore a little bit the uh, why you think the Unitarian monotheistic argument is not sufficient in, in, in terms of accounting for the truth of reality. Yeah, so so to me, it's like I'm still trying to fully piece all this together. I haven't fully pieced everything together yet, but now like I think the main part you have to start with is like critiquing what went wrong with Islam, right? Like not necessarily just for attacking Islam. Like I'm not, that's not my goal. It's more like my own personal process uh, elimination, right? Because like Sherlock Holmes, he kind of says, once you eliminate all these things, however improbable, whatever you're left with must be the truth. So I started out by eliminating atheism and then Buddhism, and now I'm on to eliminating Islam, right? And when you eliminate Islam, that's the crazy part, right? There's basically nothing else left, right? You have to be arriving at pure Christianity, and that's it. Right. And and the part, and basically how I, I would say there's really one thing that fully eliminates Islam as a possibility, which is they have one verse in the Quran that says, Jesus was not killed. He was replaced by stunt double when he was on the cross. And then Allah sent him directly to heaven. Like, I think, and that's kind of where it dawned on me, right? Like, the Muslims do not have the gospel at all. They never did, despite what the Quran claims, that people have had the gospel, had the Old Testament or whatever. No, like... Whoever wrote the Quran never understood any of that stuff at all. Because right. like, if you understood any of that stuff at all, you would not say that Jesus was replaced by stunt double. It's just the dumbest claim ever. Why do you think it's what? What, what makes it dumb to you? I mean, just to, for folks who are are not convinced, what do you? What do you... Yeah, yeah. So I wrote a thread on it. Right. Let me, let me see yeah. if I can pull it up. I had I had like a couple points on like why that's so ridiculous let me pull it up yeah it says as much as i respect certain muslim philosophers and mystics, yeah i got it that, yeah. you got it <clears throat> yeah 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 so one all right so muhammad lived like 500 some years after jesus right and first let's suppose islam is correct why did God not send someone to correct that mistake earlier, right? It's like insane to believe that God, if Islam is true, God would allow this heresy of saying Jesus was God and Jesus was crucified and resurrected persist for over 500 years. That makes no sense, right? Like if God is all powerful, why would he let his followers be led astray for that long right and the thing is like not just because like their claim is contradictory right because they claim that the gospels were slowly corrupted over time right however like it's very demonstrably true that from the very beginning of the gospels like the 12 disciples they all believed that jesus was god and jesus was crucified and resurrected so where where does this like corruption like where does that fit in the timeline it makes no sense like yeah. there's no chance for that corruption to ever happen because they all believe that from the very beginning so how can you say that you believe in the teachings of jesus yet rejected what was taught of his message from the very start so that part made no sense so that's my first contradiction i saw in the quran and then second if this is a truthful God, why would he deceive his followers with a stunt double, right? Like a stunt double switcheroo. That's not something an honest God would do, right? And one of their names for God is al Haq, which and means see, the truth, right? That's see, not the truth. See, and, and the idea of like putting somebody else to get killed for them, for God, mm -hmm is still mm -hmm. keeping the sacrificial violence of the other intact rather than self-sacrifice, yeah. right? So that's important mm -hmm. to note because yes, that has extremely different implications for a worldview and a society inculcated in that mindset, which is 
when God is put to the test on the cross, he would rather throw somebody else's skin in the game rather than take on this, the, the pain himself, right? So that is, that's going to orient your society completely different right there, right yes. yeah. there. Yeah. So important to keep that point and focus on that for a second. Extremely important point. And I think... Because Hebrews this talks about the two different sacrifices, sacrifice of the other versus self-giving sacrifice. And that's important. Mm -hmm. The Islamic yeah. world does not account for self-sacrifice at the heart of its mm -hmm. of its story, does it? Because it's saying no, when all. God's put to the test by the mob, he says, I think I'm going to kill this dude instead, not me. Yeah, yeah. And so the he's thing afraid is of death. In that sense, he keeps death anxiety intact. Exactly. It's, it's cowardly. Death anxiety. The, rule, the reign right. of death continues. Which means mm -hmm. you haven't Absolutely. got a, you, it, which means you don't really truly have a breakage away from the cyclical view of the pagan worldview, mm -hmm. because the reign of death has not been defeated in that. Mm -hmm. Right, right. That's that's a brilliant point. And the thing is, it's it's absolutely cowardly, right? Like if Jesus was, let's say, not even God, because yeah. neither of you, Jesus isn't God, but a prophet, right? Like even for a human prophet, why would he do this? Why would he just be a coward and? avoid death yeah and and they do like, they affirm that jesus said th that the stuff like you know there's no greater love than to get, lay down your life for a friend do they believe that he said that honestly i have no clue what they believe about jesus but can you imagine Other that like how can you say that one line like there is no greater love than that he who lays down lays down his life for his friend and then when it's time for him to get that opportunity he says no i actually kill that dude instead of me he looks like me let him die <laughs> Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here's another contradiction. Here's another contradiction that I didn't even think of previously because I kind of just like the idea of God sent a message to everyone in different cultures. That's what they say, right? So I like that idea initially, but upon closer examination, it actually doesn't make any sense. Right. Because because the thing is, like, if he sent a like a messenger to every culture except for the Arabs, right? Because Muhammad is the last prophet, then that's a that's a contradiction right there. Mm -hmm. Because then that, that would mean like, why did they? Because like they also claim that uh, Abraham built what something in Mecca or or something like that. I forgot the details, but yeah, like so that's kind of like a contradiction, right? So if Abraham was already in Mecca. Why was he not like giving this message to them already? And Muhammad is the last prophet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So anyway, also like, like all the historical evidence points to the crucifixion being right. true. Like the secular scholars also agree. So it's absolutely ridiculous. This illiterate guy, five hundred some years later, would have the truth, while like just everyone else just somehow got it wrong. Right. There's no evidence of that. And then next, it's it's ridiculous to deny the crucifixion, yet call Jesus the Messiah, right? Because I, because basically you're saying that you don't understand his message, yet somehow you affirm his teachings. That doesn't make any sense. Oh yeah, my point was that uh, they claim that the gospels existed somewhere in like the ether. They claim that the gospels and the Old Testament that we have currently are wrong, but God somehow has a perfect copy somewhere in the heaven. But that's a contradiction, right? Because like they they claim that God's words are perfect, which they say is the Quran. But if God's words cannot be altered, if you say the Gospels was also God's words, then how come that was altered? That's a logical contradiction right there. Mm hmm right so 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 their argument basically completely falls apart right there and and the only logical conclusion is is that the only way the quran would state things this way is if it's written by a human yeah it's some human who didn't understand the gospels or the old testament whatsoever but wanted to pay lip service to them in like a political way and then that's why he wasn't sure what aspects of it to affirm and what aspects to deny, right? And it completely mm -hmm. makes sense when you look at the history of Muhammad, right? Because he had these like 
I think Medina years and Mecca years. Mm -hmm. Um, wait, hold up. I forgot which one's which, but he, but like Muhammad was in one place, one of those locations in the beginning, right? And he had basically no followers. He was surrounded by Jews and Christians. At that time, he was more of a nice guy, right? Like in the Medina versus, yeah, I think, hold up. Let me just look it up to make sure. Yeah, so Medina is the place they migrated afterwards. Yeah, so in the Mecca years, they were more chill about things, right? They were like, all right, I'm surrounded by all these Christians and Jews. I can't badmouth them. I got to play nice to them and say there's no compulsion in religion. And Christians and Jews, their messages are valid to some degree, right? That's why they paid lip service to... Uh, Jesus is Messiah and affirmed the messages of the Old Testament prophets. However, as soon as you reach the Medina years, you you start to see more of the heresies, right? Where where they start to deny the crucifixion and resurrection because now they're like, all right, we have an army now. We can't. We don't need to act scared anymore. That's basically the only way you can explain these contradictions in the Quran, which no Muslim will ever acknowledge. They would still insist there's no logical contradiction here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so basically, they have no knowledge of the Old Testament or the Gospels, and they're just calling Jesus the Messiah in a very superficial way, which makes very little sense. And then my final point here is that if Jesus was a Muslim, like they claim, and he came only to affirm monotheism, and the Gospels were simply about affirming pure monotheism and nothing else, then why was he born of a virgin? Why did he perform any of the miracles he did? Why did he say any of the parables he did? It wouldn't make any sense, right? Mm -hmm. And and if that's all he did, why would Muhammad even be necessary, right? Because like, if Jesus was, his message was for everyone, then everyone should have already gotten the pure monotheist message and they would there would have been no misunderstanding to begin, begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah it then, there's a lot of, uh, it, it feels like uh, we're going back we're going back when we go to the is the claims of Islam. We're, we're sliding mm -hmm. back away from Revelation, mm -hmm. for sure. Right. So the only logical conclusion is that Islam was written by this illiterate guy who had a bunch of conversations with the local Jews and Muslim Jews and uh, Christians and pagan thinkers of that time, and then just kind of like cobbled together his own theories. Yeah, so that's basically my main argument against um, Islam. Like that's it's so funny, right? Because they claim that the Quran is absolutely perfect, but it's only if you um, believe in the Quran itself as absolutely perfect. It's a it's complete circular reasoning. If you look at any other evidence, it completely shows that there's just so many contradictions that make zero sense. Yeah, it's so interesting how, um, <clears throat> you know, all of these things are are becoming increasingly um, interesting for the younger generation as they're rediscovering interest in monotheism. And now you, you mentioned something to me that this interest in trying to sort out mm -hmm. which monotheism is true mm -hmm. was sparked by the recent conflict in the Middle East. Can you explain what you're what you found oh there. yeah yeah like when when the conflict started in october right like right from the start if you have read gerard you can clearly see that the jews and the muslims were in a mimetic conflict with each other and christianity is the third way out and one of the evidences of that is that the Jews and Muslims are always fighting each other, right? They're just like attacking each other back and forth nonstop for the past 50, 60, however many years. And then 
what you see is all the Christians fleeing there. And I think a couple of decades ago to like a hundred years ago, something like that, in that whole area, like especially Lebanon, like Lebanon was like over 90% Christian and now it's majority Muslim. Like, it just doesn't make any sense that these two would be the truth, right? Because they're engaged in this mimetic rivalry with each other. Well, the Christians knew that they had to get out. And not only that, it's almost like a conspiracy that they're trying to push the Christians out of there, right? Like, that's why, like, I'm not a fan of either side, right? Because, like, if you one side wins, the Christians are going to get kicked out. If the other side wins, the Christians still get kicked out, right? You see the Jews in the, I don't know if you've seen the videos where the Jews in Israel, they would spit on Christian like pilgrims who go there and check it out. And the Muslims, they're also not going to preserve any churches. They're just, they're going to destroy the churches too. Like both sides are just trying to get Christianity out of that region of the world. Yeah, I think that the um, that 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 kind of con affirms kind of the idea that Gerard talks about that the logos of reality that John talks about in John chapter one, yeah, uh, is different from the uh, Greek logos in the sense of like Heraclitus, you know, Heraclitus, where you have this idea of this logos based on violence that is at the foundation of philosophy. And he says that the Johannine logos, the logos depicted in the Gospel of John, is eternally, mm -hmm. is, is constant, not eternally, but constantly expelled from society. You know, so that's what I was thinking of when I was thinking of that mimetic mm -hmm. rivalry that those who hold fast to the way of Christ are, the, are, the, are, are kind of uh, typologically fulfilling the role of the logos and being expelled as the common kicking, you know, the kicking... Uh, post or whatever the you can kick them as you can't overcome your rival and yeah. an intractable uh you know uh duel right mm -hmm. i think it's important to think about a little bit more stuff with the trinity why is it that we you know believe the trinity versus this notion of a monad god or a god that doesn't have relationality in his being and i think that this is another area where mimetic anthropology helps us see if mimetic anthropology is correct, that we're not islands unto ourselves. We are not self-generating desire brains on sticks, right? We have to actually like look around at us and, and see around other people's beings modeling desires. And we catch those desires in a, in a, and so relationship is what is actually the real thing in between each other. Mm -hmm. Your relationship between your grandmother is different between your relationship and your friend or your relationship between your uh, follower on Twitter who talks to you or whatever. All those things are different aspects. The relationships are actually what uh, ground us, not uh, something as a secondary to our own unique persona, our own desires mm -hmm. that we're generating ourselves. And I think yeah. that uh, you can look at feral children, you know, children who are raised in the wilderness with animals. If they're mm -hmm. in there long enough at a young enough age and long enough time period, they, it's impossible to get them to learn language or to get them to sit and be what we would call human relationship as we understand it. This mm -hmm. is different from a kitten or, you know, dogs that could be separated weeks from their mother. And they mm -hmm. can kind of do dog things, even though they don't have much mm -hmm. time, you know, with their dog parents, so to speak, or same thing yeah. with other animals. But humans require a significant amount of time to even be what we would call human. And they get yeah. that by mimetically absorbing like a sponge, all of mm -hmm. the desires and behaviors and patterns and language and processing. They absorb all of that from their family unit that's around them. Right. And I think mm -hmm. that reflects the Trinitarian nature of the creator yeah. that created us. Right. It was if, if he let us make man in our image, what is the image? The image is a family relationship, right? And mm -hmm. I don't understand how a God could make us in his image uh, who is not having relationality and love in his being. Yeah. Because that it seems to be the very thing that defines us the most. 
mm-hmm. is our relationality aspect, our completely interdividual, mimetic, dependent sense of mm-hmm. self. And also our highest aspiration in our existence is love. And both of those yeah. things are are affirmed in the notion of the Trinity, right? Yep. And, and then and then you get into this notion of like, uh, you know, why do we <clears throat> why do we have a desire? Uh, to see th- why why do we believe that history is going somewhere? Again, you don't get that if you don't have an incarnational yeah. theology in which God and heaven inter- are intertwined with earth and the physical and the material, right? Yeah. In breaking together, uh, I think Islam keeps very cleanly the Gnostic dualism of other philosophies like Plat- Plat- Platonism, and I, I think Christianity is an error. I think when it goes too far into getting excited about Platonism and trying Mm -hmm. to incorporate those ideas, it it turns Christianity more and more into another ideology like Islam, where it's a dominant submission concept, right? Mm -hmm. What does Islam mean? The word. Yeah. Submission. Right. So what do you do with an ideology? You submit to it. Right. That's the same thing with all other ideologies. Mm -hmm. Christianity is not an ideology. It's not a Cartesian framework that you submit to and surrender to. All ideologies only have dominance and submission as a mechanism for yeah. engaging in it. Does that make sense? And so, in that way, I want to make something clear. And if you, if I'm, if you need to interject, just please speak up. But uh, I just want to finish the point, wh- which is that, um, in that way, you know, a lot of people say, "Well, look at how fragile and weak Christianity is. Look at how it's being overrun by feminism and nihilism. Look at Islam doesn't allow that. No, it's actually a sign of its of its actual." strength, it's anti-fragility, because Christianity actually has the freedom to be able to take the blows Mm -hmm. of a competing heresy like feminism and nihilism, absorb Mm -hmm. it, and beat it back, whereas Islam only is a fragile dominant submission mechanism that doesn't actually incorporate incarnational mimetic modeling of a person, not a text, you see, Islam yeah, is text. Yeah, that's a logo. Yeah, that, that's, that's logos of philosophy, right? Yeah, that's exactly the point I was gonna bring up when you first mentioned John one, right? So, so basically, that's that's another part of Islam that I did not fully realize. That's what they believed until recently, right? Is that in Christianity, Jesus is the Word made flesh. But for them, the Quran is supposedly the uncreated word of God. But that just runs into so many issues in a way that, yeah, there's so many issues with it. Actually, let me let me go through the issues. So one, when I, when I started debating these like Muslims in the past week, one of the things that keeps on coming up is how they say how perfect the Quran is, right? And they say, look, if there's even one contradiction you can find in the Quran, then the whole thing is false. The Quran says it itself. And we find no contradictions in the Quran, which therefore the Quran is correct. Like that's their argument, right? Anytime you bring up anything, that's their argument. But there lies in the fragility, right? If you, that's the black swan um, mechanism right there, right? If you even find one contradiction or one falseness in Quran, then the whole thing falls apart. While for Christianity, that's not a problem, right? You can say, you can attack the Bible in how whatever way you want. It doesn't matter because Jesus was the Word made flesh. Right, right, right. Yeah. So that that that's and, and again, when you say that it is that the Quran is the text un you know untainted by materiality, right? That's mm-hmm. dualism. That's that's a, that that gives way for Gnosticism. That gives way for ideology. Yeah ideology is a dead end there is and, and 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 to the extent that christianity is perverted over and over again by ideologues into another ideology to choose mm-hmm. from mm-hmm. it fails because it's not accounting for the reality which is not something that you can mentally assent to but rather something that changes your perception of reality itself that's yeah. what people like you understand, Marshall McLuhan and these other folks like Rene Girard. They were they were scratching in the dark at this, right? Which is that that Christianity is a perception change, not uh, not a, a set of propositions. Those mm. propositions can be helpful to kind of understand what's going on, but it's not mm. the thing itself, right? Whereas yeah. it, Islam is just another ideology that allows for a kind of 
detachment of the mind from the body, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it all leads back to Jesus was the word made flesh. All, all these other religions, they don't get it. That's why, that's basically my conclusion recently, right? That's why basically Christianity has to be the only one true way because all these other religions, they're completely missing the concept of the word made flesh. Right. Um. <clears throat> So you had some, did you have any other points you wanted to make that you were uh, going through there about? Some yeah, yeah, of all their points. That was one of the points I was going to get to. Um, I also want to go through how like how Muslims try to convert people away from Christianity and how you might want to tackle that issue. Go ahead. So, so basically. In Islam, their first principle is the Shahada, right? Which means there's only one true God and Muhammad is his prophet. So, however, this is a huge contrast to Christianity, which says, well, the first thing you need to affirm is that Jesus is your, is your savior and he died on the cross for your mm -hmm. sins. And the sneaky way that the Muslims get about go about in converting people is that they never mention that they deny the death and resurrection of Christ. They don't tell you that. They start with saying, oh, do you believe there's one God? Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I do believe there's only one God, right? That's not a thing you object to. And then they say all these thing, good things about Muhammad and say, do you think he's a prophet? And to the lay Christian, that doesn't really mean much, right? Like, you don't really study as a lay Christian, like, what prophet means, like, right? You can just, like, there is a specific definition of it somewhere, but as a lay person, you don't think about it. You're just like, all right, cool. You say he's a cool guy, and he affirms that monotheism is true. Why not? Sure, I'll accept it. And that's where they get you, right? Because that's their statement of faith and you don't even need to go through a baptism or anything as long as you say that statement they consider you a muslim see that's that's another sign of ideology not uh not something mm -hmm. that is going to affect the actual see what i want to understand here is that islam is a is a, is is outmoded by what christianity does it's a it's a retreat it's a retreat backwards in history and i'm sorry yeah. to say that's true and Ideology mm -hmm. is too. All, all these yeah. ideologies are too, because they have an inadequate understanding of human nature and and the relationship of of humans to uh, religion, which means to bind together, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 the way in which we actually transmit these 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 uh, claims of reality through history. Because again, mm -hmm. when you're saying there's no incarnational action, that's not. That's not, you know, if it's a mental ascent. Now, I know they do the, they, you have to do the prayer, right? That, that, that's how you have to do the particular prayer and the direction. So there's a little bit of incarnation there, I guess. And I mean, in, in some sense of action, is that yeah. required of you to become Muslim? I, I don't remember these uh, claims. Um, I think it's required as a practice if you are Muslim, but it's not like, it's, it's not, not... The into Islam. Yeah. Is that true? Is that correct? Yeah, and there's all sorts of like weird stuff where like the yeah another thing is like they just really do not understand the concept of uh Jesus redeeming all your sins at all right because for them it's still kind of like a balancing scale of your of your actions right so they're like it's basically earning like experience points in a video game. It's like, all right, you, if you do this prayer, you aim, you earn some bonus points. If you do this other prayer, you earn more bonus points. And if you do this other prayer and fast, now all your sins for the past year are erased. And then the crazy part is like, if you if you get martyred, you skip judgment completely and just go direct to heaven. Yeah. So there's a kind of, again, the reign of death there is, is interesting because it's not martyrdom in a non-violent sense it's martyrdom in a struggle against in a violent way against your opponents right mm, yeah. so that's that's that um you know is is not the same concept of a non-violently laying down your life 
mm-hmm. uh, as the martyrs in Christianity did, or you know the the uh, the church fathers or the apostles laying mm-hmm. down their life in witness to the truth mm-hmm. um, to the point of death. Unfortunately, that's what locks up both the sides in the conflict in Israel and Gaza. Mm -hmm. is that uh, you have two religions that are still under the reign of death and it drives them towards, you know, trying to, um, to depict their side as more noble in their accumulation of martyrdom than the other side. Meanwhile, both sides are uh, engaged in martyring the others through violence and then justifying it as, as a defense of martyr, (laughs) you know, Mm -hmm. we get to kill them in defense. And then we position ourselves for the self-righteous act of being killed in the middle of the conflict of the struggle for land. Yeah. Land. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, look, we're not trying to preach. uh, We understand that, you know, Christianity has often been abused and misused because it's not an ideology it you know you can go and take it and turn it into an ideology and brainwash people mimetically to follow your cult of personality that's what Karl Marx did it was just you know another christian heresy mm-hmm. just like islam trying to take pieces of the christian revelation and then revivify sacrificial violence back into the mix okay yeah that's what's going on there you know in my in my opinion <clears throat> yeah and another thing that a lot of people don't realize, I think a lot of these like evangelical politicians, they make the mistake is in thinking that Judaism is the original Judaism of the Old Testament. But no, it's not. It's actually just another Christian heresy. Right. Where it was the first heresy where they denied Christ. Yeah. It's a reaction. Yeah. To the um Paul talks about in Galatians chapter three. Um, the promise he says uh, the promises in chapter 16 he says uh, excuse me verse 16 he says the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed scripture does not say and to seeds meaning many people but and to your seed meaning one person who is Christ I think that's interesting because that you know that shows there's, a, is, there's an interesting thing happening there okay it shows that all of the promises. This is I'm going to show going to the going back to the Ten Commandments, right? I, I mm-hmm. mentioned that there's a chiastic structure, which is where you look at the parallelism of the first point, and then the last point, and then the second point, and then the second to last point, and the third point, and then the third to last point, all the way to the very core, right? What is in mm-hmm. the very middle of those Ten Commandments? You have the five commandments, and then the next five commandments. The only blessing that you get is right in the middle of those commandments. It's after you talk about <clears throat> honor your father and your mother. Here's the blessing that your days may be long upon the land, which the Lord, your God is giving you. That is the center of the chiastic structure of the 10 commandments. So you do all of these things, right? Like you were saying that the parallel between the first commandment and the last commandment, um, you shall have no other gods before me. That's the first commandment, right? The last mm-hmm. commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. The emphasis is on the neighbor and what they possess, mm-hmm. not on the objects. The emphasis is on the neighbor's possession of those objects. That's mimetic desire. Mm-hmm. Everything Gerard is talking about is just an attempt to explain what the Bible has already set in motion in yeah. human history. It's so important to understand this that, excuse me, I'll, I'll put it this way. To the extent that whatever Gerard is saying is true, it is already something that has been revealed in the text yes. of the biblical uh, witness of Jesus. Mm-hmm. I'll put it that way. Yeah. <clears throat> and so when it says, you should, like you said, you shall have no other gods before me, that is the heart of mimetic desire. When you look at someone who has more wealth than you and you say, I want to have the car they have, you're idolizing and making that neighbor a God. Why do you make that neighbor a God? Because he, 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 he or she has the image of God, 
which is what we're really longing for, right? To be one with God's uh, relationality. We're longing to be reunited in, you know, the kingdom of heaven with, uh, you know, all relationships distorted and being united with our creator. But we, we look at people around us who have glimpses of the creator in them, and we covet and elevate them to the point of being considered godlike because mm-hmm. we feel like we're unhappy until we get what they have. Yeah. If I get to half a million Twitter followers, then I'll be really a big deal, right? Like the other guy. <laughs> then you get to that level and you say, oh, man, if I could have two million like those guys, they don't deserve two million. How do they get two million? They just post cat photos or something you know what the heck really yeah. so you think i've got something profound to say if i can't even get to two million like the guy who posts cat photos mm-hmm. who, what does this mean it means that i you know i haven't arrived at my full guru status potential i must keep being mm-hmm. unhappy right or you mm-hmm. say if i could just get a property in this zip code like this guy or her, this girl that i like then i'll show then i'll be there so mm-hmm. you're still using your neighbor as a god, as a sign of, uh, and the objects are almost tokens of their godness, right? But it's really their god, it's their being that you're desiring. You you don't want to be happy with what you have, which is what the, the original sin of Adam and Eve was, right? Is they coveted their neighbor's possessions. Their neighbor, in this sense, was God, who dwelt among them. And he had, uh, you know, they were jealous of his godness, right? Mm-hmm. They were jealous of his deity, and they were jealous of his ability to set boundaries of differentiation. They wanted to be a, be able to have that status for themselves. Say, no, actually, I can reorient the boundaries and say I incorporate this food into my, uh, you know, my my lifestyle. And even though you're saying I shouldn't, um, okay. so they were coveting. And actually, you know, Eve was coveting Adam's status as the head because she okay. wanted to make her own decision without you know her husband having any involvement in it, right? So she was rivalrously coveting and, and making a god out of Adam's maleness, right, and, and, and manhood. And Adam, by not being proactive, by being passive, was coveting his wife's being, right, mm-hmm. of being the helper and saying, well, I don't have to take a proactive stance against the snake. He could have crushed the snake when it was talking to his wife, but whatever happened, he wasn't there. Uh, it got out of hand. There should have been a maybe, you know, some kind of a, a you know, a, this is what we do protocol developed if you get near that snake, you know, and that was not established. And yeah. so they were coveting each other's being. The Eve coveted Adam's being of being the leader. Adam yeah. coveted Eve's being of being the passive bystander in terms of the, you know, the one that needs to uh, be a helper rather than the initiator of these choices. And then the, uh, and then they, and then of course uh, the serpent, was coveting their being of what they were made to be in God's, what God had designed them to be. He wanted to ruin that. He wanted to destroy that, consume it. And he also was coveting God's being, the serpent. And yeah. the only one who's not coveting and making other gods out of everybody is God himself in that story. But yeah. just to go back, just to point, my point I want to make is, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. All of those other commandments are all parallel together, but the core of it is that your days may be long upon the uh, that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And then we see in Galatians, the letter to the Galatians, that Paul says that that land promise, right, was actually intended for not seeds, as in many people, but seed, as in Christ. Okay, mm-hmm. so that means that the whole world is now the land promise given to Christ because he has become the ruler of all of history and all of the land and all of the world in history. And that you, having faith in Christ as a human person, are going to be able to participate in that promise. So this yeah. is the elevation of all human persons. Mm-hmm. And it's only, and see, so that picture of that all of these different commandments are pointing to what Christ is going to fulfill. That mm-hmm. he did not, he did not covet uh, his neighbor's uh, being. He did not covet the Pharisees' position. He did not covet the Sadducees. He did not cover the Essenes. He did not, he was not coveting uh, John the Baptist's social status. He did not covet 
any of those positions, right? And he also did not make a god of any of those people. And he also did not uh, commit adultery. He didn't steal, right? He didn't. He didn't use God's name in vain, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, he didn't. He he honored his father and his mother. He did all those things. He 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 completed that, so that our days may be long upon the earth, and his days will be long upon the earth. Meaning he will win in history, and is winning in history. So important. Yeah, yeah. Like everything you just said in the past couple of minutes is like completely mind blowing, right? It's like once you have that understanding, it's like there's no denying that this is the one absolute truth, right? It's like everything that the Bible has ever talked about, like in any of the passages links back to all the other passages in right. this completely coherent narrative that you never see in any other religion. Like I've explored basically all the other religions and they, none of them have any of this, right? Like they say the Quran is perfect, but it's like, there's nothing in the Quran that's like this, nothing at all. Right. And it's, and, and there, and there, it, history is unfolding according to what was predicted about Jesus, right? And yeah. what Jesus himself predicted, which is that we are moving away from uh, uh, religions and cultures founded on uh, cornerstone sacrifices, right? And yeah. cornerstone sacrifices is where you would bury a human person under the first cornerstone laid in the building of a new project or a new city. This is something they practice all over the world. Uh, and Peter talks about that we are now going to be living sacrifices as opposed to dead sacrifices, right? That we are going to give of our life and our time and our creativity and our spirit of love, and that's what's going to build history forward, not sacrificial violence building history. And any religion or ideology that continues to deceive us into saying, no, but we need to crack a few eggs to make an omelet is an attempt to deviate us from the truth that's unfolding before us. Mm -hmm. That history is moving in the image of Christ and it will continue to do so. Yeah. Because we, I want you, I want, I always, I, I use these points, but I want to emphasize this again. Anybody who says that we're, just repeating history only is is absolutely blind by ideology mm -hmm. because history is different. I also, you know, look at the January 6th thing. They said that was a whole violent insurrection. It was a manufactured event. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't get the guys. They were punching and kicking people at best. Nobody had a gun and shot anybody like that from the protesters. They were taking selfies, Okay. If you had a Spartacus revolution in Rome, would they be taking selfies and waving flags with grandmas when they got into the Roman Senate? No. 2,000 years after Christ, we're becoming less and less violent, less and less mimetically oriented towards direct forms of violence. We're always trying to find other ways out of it. Even though we're addicted to violence, our appetite for it in a direct way is, 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 is quickly losing mm -hmm. itself. We're losing our appetite. It's so important to understand that. And it's affecting the whole world because the whole world is still emulating the West because it, it, it it's still emulating the West in a kind of worldly coveting way, right? The world mm -hmm. emulates the West with a vow, with a coveting aspiration, mimetic desire, mm -hmm. right? I will put on a suit and I will talk about human rights because those who have more wealth and power relative to my nation do so thing, do that. And I want more of what they have. Right. But in so, but, but by imitating those Western values as corrupted as they are from Christianity, there's still enough of the, of the contagion of Christianity still within their rotten corruption mm -hmm. that it's a trap. Those other nations try to imitate it. I want the glory. I want the wealth as the West displays it. So I will talk about human rights and I will be a little bit more open about my own na national mythology. And as mm -hmm. they do that, it, it confounds the order and myth making of their whole society, breaks it, and they become more and more attuned to the human person as Christ mm -hmm. is the ultimate human person. All societies are going to continue to elevate the human person in all shapes and sizes, in history. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? 
They will yeah. imitate, they will, like, you know, what is Singapore doing? Singapore imitates the West in terms of the buildings and capitalism and all these things. But ultimately, it will be its own undoing in its attempt to keep that imitation going, elevating humans to a degree, but also trying to continue with older forms of sacrificial mythmaking. You can't have it both ways. The more you imitate, even if for a worldly ambition, the more the Christian gospel technology will infect your society, opening up the space for people to develop human personhood mm -hmm. in all of its different manifestations. Yeah. So all history, when Jesus says, I, when I am lifted up, I am drawing all men unto me, that's happening. It's mm -hmm. happening. Because yeah. the terms of the debate between Israel and Gaza are set by Christ as the king. Mm -hmm. He's the one that said the meek shall inherit the earth. And what are these war factions doing? They're presenting their meek, their children, their dead slain children as a sign of their superiority. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are arguing and fighting in the public sphere of world history under the terms set by Christ, and they're trying to manipulate it and game the debate, right? Mm -hmm. I've got these, so therefore I can kill you. So that they will still fail, and it will destroy both of their internal coherencies will be de devoured. Yeah. Right. And that's what we're all struggling under right now. That's what it means to have birth pains as, as the new, as Christ continues. This is what yeah. it looks like. Mm -hmm. you know? They didn't, you, you did not go, you know, before Christ, you did not go to the world stage and say, I've got children and women killed and brutalized and raped. That makes me right. You didn't do that. Why would you do that? Right. Yeah. So I always say if Christ was only a man, it's even more miraculous that one man can set in motion such a a, a monumental reversal and change of history. You yeah. know what I mean? Mind-blowing. staggering, but, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, that's the incredible thing about having this Gerardian perspective, right? Because, like, Gerard didn't say anything new. He just, like, put into explicit philosophical language why the whole Bible is coherent with this message. Right. He he gave us modern language as an interpretation to help us see what was happening, you know, in a more sharper way on the anthropological side of what's happening in the scripture, right? Yeah. So he helped, you know, we're we're the ones that were kind of uh you know blinded by our, our own modernity and our own search. And so he kind of using that framework helps us reveal the truth of what's happening, you know? And um and I always say you can't have a, a theology without an anthropology if you're going to do Christianity, you know? And that's yep. that's the number one takeaway for folks who are tempted by Islam. I would say if you're tempted by Islam, it's because you have a disembodied Christianity that you've been playing around with. Mm -hmm. You've been having a theology of Christianity without an anthropology of Christianity. When you have both accurately put together, now you're talking about Christianity, and now you'll understand how ridiculous it would be to slink back into ideology, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and this is a true faith, right? Because, like, a lot of people who may self-identify as Christian, I don't think they really get this message that we just talked about today. Yeah. So what does that mean? I mean, once you actually understand this part, it's just undeniable, right? Like Christ is the truth. You don't need to like defend Christianity as if it's just another ideology. It is the ultimate truth that encompasses like just all reality. Right. Right. And it's true that the more we persist in leaning on sacrificial violence and ideology, the more our rivalries will destroy us. This is what Paul, this is what Jesus just predicts when he says, "Mother will be against daughter, and father against son." That's mm -hmm. the consequence of a society that's Christ haunted, but doesn't want to give up its sacrificial violence prerogative, right? And the more you lean on sacrifice to create order and differentiation in a Christ haunted world, the more it backfires, creates dissatisfaction and schism which then feeds back into more mimetic rivalry. You see, the only mm. way out is through Christ. You can't. Mm. You can't do it any other way. Yeah. 
You see what I mean? The, the more people say, well, no, I don't want the full Christianity. I want to have my Caesar. I want to have my emperor. I want to have this or that attached with Christianity. It just, it keeps breaking down into mm -hmm. more endless schismatic, undifferentiated rivalry. That's why gender will continue to be what was a relatively differentiation that could hold. It's now increasingly becoming a point of mimetic undifferentiation. Not just in the obvious transgender role, but also in the fact that I've, I've had people on where guys think that the only way they can get a woman to marry them is to sit in the gym all day and look at themselves in a mirror and do all kinds of things. You know, they think that that, you know, physical appeal, uh, just like men have a physical appeal towards they, what they like, right? They, they think women have the same words towards them at the same degree. That's undifferentiation of gender, mm -hmm. right? And women feel like, well, I got to get a high paying job to be a great, successful, you know, woman that will attract some male. It's like, wait, wait a second. See, all these gender dif undifferentiations and the uh, class undifferentiation, that's something that's not talked about enough. Mm -hmm. That the wealthy live poor and the poor live wealthy in this kind of weird undifferentiation. You know what I mean? Where it's like the boundaries between, yes, there are some clear differences between a billionaire status. And a person who is poor, right? But they still yep. get the same garbage health care when they have Alzheimer's. They still get the same garbage. You know what I mean? There's so many points of equal of 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 uh, equality here between the billionaire and the poor person. That that again is going to continue to exacerbate uh, conflict and rivalry. Because, in other words, a hundred years ago, a billionaire would be way more of an external mediator than he is today. Does that make sense? Yeah. So the, the 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 external mediators are less likely to create rivalry, but because the billion because the material wealth difference between the poor and the billionaire is increasingly becoming undifferentiated, even though at the same time, real wealth is actually increasing. It's just a weird phenomenon, but the but the experience of it is becoming increasingly undifferentiated. Yeah, and it's going to create this weird you know push pull dynamic between the poor and the rich. Mm -hmm. Whereas before you were in the enclave of hierarchy and you kind of stayed amongst your people and you stayed amongst your people and you stayed amongst your class and the different levels of the hierarchy. Now it's all superfluous. It's all very elastic. Mm -hmm. It's all very like up in the air, you know? Yeah. That's the influencer culture. Everyone thinks you can become a micro celebrity. Right. And that, and that's going to disintegrate Hollywood. That'll disintegrate the music industry. This is an apocalypse that's going to disintegrate all these hierarchies as long as we persist in relying on sacrificial violence to try to put order back to it. The yeah. more you hit it, it backfires, blows up, and it creates, you know, shrapnel that flies all around and damages the culture more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it really just all comes down to understanding how important the crucifixion and resurrection is and how important it is to understand Christ as the word made flesh, right? Is anything else, it's all just human-made ideologies. Like to comprehend how everything makes sense, the only way you can go about it is by understanding Christ as the word made flesh. Yeah. It's important to to realize what are the distinctions between the resurrection of Christ and the mythic resurrections of the dying and rising gods is that the mythic rising, uh, dying and rising gods created unity on a lie. Mm -hmm. Now that the lie has been exposed to the world, it creates schism. And that's exactly what happens with the real resurrection. Unlike mm -hmm. mythic resurrections like Horus, uh, which creates unity because the myth persisted for a long time and created unity and, and hierarchy was continually maintained by these beliefs in the ancient Egypt. Unlike those, the story of the reported real historical resurrection of Christ created schism within the local community to the point mm -hmm. of people being willing to die for the truth that they had seen. Mm -hmm. So it did not create unity. It did not revivify the cyclical pattern of history of dying and rising. It broke through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, to the point where it started to break apart. That's what Jesus said. I have come to reveal things hidden since the foundation of the world and not to bring peace as the world understands it. Right. Because peace as the world understands it is, 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 is structured based on a lie and violence. And once mm -hmm. that's disclosed, 
that the news of that resurrection spreading to the whole world will create cleavage and breaking apart of peace founded on mutual exclusion of a common enemy. That's going to continue to happen. That will yeah. continue to happen. The Islamic culture will continue to be schismatically destroyed from within the more it continues to rely on sacrificial violence to mm-hmm. maintain its sense of self. The same with yeah. all other religions, all other philosophies, all other worldviews will continue to be uh, producing schism the more they continue to try to produce uh, unanimity through an act of sacrificial violence that will only result in more schism because people's consciences are starting to be pricked more and more and they start to recognize, wait a second, this is unjust, this does not make, this is not necessary. This person is not 100% fully convincing to be guilty. <laughs> and if there's yeah. any shred of doubt, that's where the problem is, right? Mm-hmm. That's where the That's where the culture falls apart. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess I do have another question for you, which is how would you explain the different schisms of different denominations within Christianity? To the extent that they maintain an ideological approach to a relationship with Christ. Mm. That's a good takeaway. Okay, to the extent that you come together in your community and fellowship with Christ, and you're maintaining your sense of unity based on who we are not— Thank God we're not the Baptists. Thank God we're not the Orthodox. Thank God we're not the Catholics. Thank God we're not this or that, right? As to the extent that you are maintaining your unity, even if it's not physical expulsion, if it's an ideological expulsion of a rivalrous group that is too close to you, but yet, you know what I mean? You have to rival. You're right. When you make Christ the object of your life rather than the subject, that changes your orientation to how you're going to deal with him. If he is an object that you can mentally attain through propositional assent of correct ideological beliefs about Christ, then you can hold that as an object in rivalry with other factions that claim to have the object that that you say you do. That creates mimetic rivalry, which creates schism. To the extent that you order your society of your community, of your local church society, I'm saying, to the extent that it's modeled based on incarnational love, do not resist evil with violence. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. Wash the feet of those beneath you in the hierarchy. When you orient it with those incarnational actions, it will create a mimetic culture, which is a much more anti-fragile environment to transmit the truth of the gospel because it's enfleshed, right? So when turn the other cheek, if you actually practice that in different ways and make that the ground of your faith, the imitation of the actions of Christ, rather than making the ground of your faith your ideological mental ascent in contest with your rivals who claim to have the objective truth of Christ contained within their walls, to the extent that that maintains itself, it creates schism. To the extent that you maintain unity based on agape love and self-giving as the Trinity does, then you will have uh, the opportunity for the faith to, to, to work and move mountains, as Christ says. You will do greater things than me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's so if you're, if you're, if you're, stuff. if your church mimetic, see, everybody has role models, right? And if your church role models, and here's how it works, even if you have kind of an ideological Cartesian Christianity in your church community, but your church leaders are still modeling very, very uh, amazing grace, right? And mercy, right? And humility. If it's still modeling that, the faith is transmitted despite the Cartesian errors that are picked up along the way through the generations. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so that's the extent to which Christianity thrives even in error. But still, mm-hmm. those errors do, do do have the opportunity for schism to be developed, right? Because it becomes a, a, a contest over an object. I own this object because I am a part of the correct uh, denomination, and these are why we are correct and they're not. And it, to the extent that you are not, uh, you know, modeling 100% conformity to that ideology about Christ, you get expelled or shunned, right? Which then creates schism, right? Because when you expel and shun someone, Mm-hmm. from your community it creates a, a a kind of energy around their movement which is why denominations get power right yeah. a lot of these denominations that were created especially the protestant denominations here there they they were started by founders who were expelled by a denomination they were a part of before right 
And it's the act of expulsion that creates a kind of martyr's energy around their ideas, which then sets forth a kind of momentum to create a new movement that is ultimately a schism, right? But see, yeah. all of those schisms are happening as a kind of Cartesian overlay to what that's kind of not at all the point of what Christ was all about, you know? It, well, all I'm saying is it's not it's not to say that those propositions have no basis. No, I'm not making a postmodern claim that you can't, you know, have mental propositions about Christianity, but to the extent that you make those models about Christ the actual ground of your faith, it creates the room for schism to take place. That is a brilliant explanation, right? And that's that kind of goes kind of like goes back to my debates with these Muslims is they do not get this point at all, right? Because they're always looking at points in the Bible or whatever, point by point. They they're treating it as an ideology. They just don't understand it's Christ the person. It's not about all these specific little minuscule petty points that you're trying to do a gotcha in logic with it. That all that stuff doesn't matter one bit. Because Christ does not create an ideology, but is creating a revelation that humans have to use agency to carry, it's messier in that mm -hmm. sense, right? Christianity yeah. is it, it kind of can it can open up the space for messiness in the sense that it elevates the human person to such a radical degree that no other ideology has ever done. You know, mm -hmm. look at look at the fruits of Marxism. It does not elevate the human person. Look at the mm -hmm. fruits of all of these ideologies. They don't elevate the human person. When you elevate the human person, it will create radical opportunities for error. But that's the point of God's love, right, is that God loves us so much that he's willing to respect our agency and working out the implications of what he did in history without giving us an ideological thing to just submit to, because if that was the case, we would never own it for ourselves, Yes. He wants us to own it for ourselves, to walk on water with him. That's something mm -hmm. the Islamic folks and the other ideolo ideologies don't understand, right? That why mm -hmm. does God want us to walk on water with him, right? Because he wants us to own it for ourselves, and he's willing to risk us doing our catastrophic things that we do, right, well, mm -hmm. of abusing gospel revelation to exploit and hurt each other and, and do all kinds of terrible corruptions, He's willing to endure that because it's the, the end result of us freely owning it for ourselves and not just in a fake way submitting to it as another ideology to pretend like you're under, which is what Islam does and its converts. To the extent mm -hmm. that you own it for yourself, you imbue the, the revelation and the truth of God's being in your life. And that is so much more of a victory. That's so much more of theosis, of becoming like God, right, which is the point of history. Yep. Theosis is often talked about as on the personal level, but I think it needs to be talked about more on the human species level as well, that the human species itself is going through a theosis. And that and that reality itself and earth and, and the material world is also indwelling. It's what that's what Paul talks about. Mm -hmm. Creation and groaning. It talks about the uh, the creation waiting for the sons of God to be revealed to set it free from the bondage to decay. So creation itself is going through a theosis as 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 the kingdom of heaven continues to reveal itself in the kingdom of earth and earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer, right? That's the hope. That's the that's the vision that our founder, Christ is the founder of the of, of the Homo sapiens. Right? That's the tech bro language, right? He's the founder. And yeah. you and you have to emulate and imitate his culture that he sets forth. And he doesn't create an ideology that says, if you don't do this, I'm going to kill you, right? When you, when you add in the sacrificial threat, it's a shortcut to heaven that leads to hell on earth, mm. right? That's why Islam will fail and continues to fail because it's, a, it's the threat of dominance that gets people to comply in a kind of superficial sense. Yeah, okay, we're Islamic here. We don't have mm. much say in this matter, <laughs> right? It's a fear of death that's getting people to, to submit. And a fear of death religion is ultimately going to be a, a religion that lives by the sword and dies by the sword, as we see. <clears throat> right. Yep. Yeah. And that's why I don't really believe in these like point by point debates, right? Because that's just kind of falling into another type of mimetic rivalry. Really, it's just you have to present the truth of Christ on its own and it's undeniable. That's it.
And here's the other, here's another superpower that Christianity gives us that we need to use more, right? Is it allows us to make art like nobody else. Christ haunted minds, even if they're rejecting Christianity in their hearts, still can make some of the greatest art in the world. So how much more good art could we make if we actually were making great art and not being in rebellion to God doing so? Yeah. Does that make sense? So Hollywood is a Christ haunted industry. Mm -hmm. You know, the greatest independent artists that make profound movies and art and films, poetry, whatever, it's all set. They're all swimming in Jesus's fishbowl. They're swimming in the water of his revelation. But it could be so much better if it would be done without it being in rebellion. Mm -hmm. Because rebellion just leads to nihilism, which is why art is failing and entertainment is failing. So I would say that one of the ways that you can show not just the superiority of the Christian faith in the daily actions. When someone insults you, disrespects you, you forgive them. That's superior strength. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's the evidence of God's superiority, the real God's superiority to all ideological gods. Mm -hmm. All ideological gods are very afraid of death, and therefore they will, uh, you know, they will make you uh, not want to forgive someone because you're afraid of death, and you and and, and to feel to feel hurt. Socially is a sign of like social death, which is like a sign of your impending physical death as a species. Right? You know what I'm saying? That's why people don't want to forget because they're afraid of death. Right? You see what I mean? They're afraid that if I let this slight happen, that it's going to socially marginalize me as weak, which will lead me that much closer to my extinction through death. But when you know that when your creator says that I have defeated death and you trusting in me, defeating death will allow you to move mountains. That's a real phenomenon. That's not, he is not making a pie in the sky um, statement mm -hmm. to just make you feel uh, like kind of like a patronizing feeling. No, he's giving you an actual reality that you can live in. That means mm -hmm. you make better art. It means you make better businesses with better integrity, better ethics, better innovations. And that makes we, that means that we need to do signs and wonders. We need to heal. I always say this yet to heal the big diseases with, with, uh, with, with drugs that are inexpensive and can't be patented. Uh, we need to heal the big diseases, heal the big uh, problems like pollution and scarcity of energy should be paying $3 and 80 cents for a gallon of gas. It's ridiculous. How stupid is that? That's not a Christian incarnation of energy. That's ridiculous. That's a stupid Cartesian outdated, sacrificially pagan way of doing gas or, or energy. Energy yeah. should be abundant by now. Christians should act like it. Now here's, here's the, here's the superpower in that sense that Christianity gives you with Christianity. You have a hermeneutic of suspicion of group think all around you, including established physics, including established energy, including established ways of doing legal theory. You have a hermeneutic of suspicion because you understand that those are ideologies not drop down from heaven like the Quran's claims to be, but rather are mimetically mediated. So you understand that when you hear the science, a Christian epistemology, whether you're metaphysically claiming dogmas of Christian or not, you're still, if you're suspicious of the term the science from those in power, you are thinking and acting like Christ would in that moment. Yeah. Just like Jesus called bluff, he called he called bluff on, on his religious leaders because he knew that they were whitewashed tombs hiding death inside, but looking pretty on the outside, just like people with white coats coming up and telling you, you must take this product. It's the greatest thing ever made. And then people are getting injured and harmed yeah. and killed. Right. Yeah. But th that's why it says so that your days may be long on the earth. <laughs> if you, yeah. if you imitate the way of Christ, your days may be long on the earth is not just like that, that, that his day as King of history will be long. It will, but also your day can literally be, <laughs> much more prosperous and more prone to having a long, healthy life when you have yeah. the, the same type of hermeneutic of suspicion that he has in assessing the group think of his time because he understood them to be sacrificially enclosed hive mm -hmm. mind, uh, you know, dogmas. And when you keep that mindset intact in your assessment of biology, if you're a biology student or a chemist or a chemical engineer or anything that's making and doing and building things, it gives you an advantage that no other ideology can ever compete with. Oh yeah, yeah. So, so that actually 
brings up some a story I want to tell you. So this is actually how my dad came to Christ, like back in like communist China in the eighties, right? Because he was suspicious of the ideology of biology back then, right? Because they believed in something called junk DNA, where apparently 80, 90% of your DNA is junk that does nothing. And he was very suspicious of that claim. Wow. And around that same time, I think he came across some sort of Christian missionary. And he basically said, yeah, this makes sense. Wow. There you go. What a great example. Mm -hmm. What a great example. And when you realize people like Stanley Pons and Martin Fleischman, who in 1989 and said that they had created cold fusion, which is room temperature nuclear energy, and they got railroaded by the scientific establishment to the point where Stanley Pons is still in hiding in France. He has never stepped foot back in America, as far as we know. Then yeah. you realize, wait a second, if this is a scientific process, why do people get expelled? Maybe they got some of their stuff wrong, but why is he expelled? Why is he in hiding? Ever since his discovery of room temperature nuclear energy, did he violate the holy of holies of scientism as a Gnostic yeah. religion? <laughs> did yeah. he, as a chemist, watch this. You can just see the religion of all around you. Stanley Pons yeah. was one of the top chemists. Martin Fleischmann, he's passed. Both of them were completely expelled and shunned by the community because they were chemists and they were making claims that were going to encroach on the territory of physics, which is considered to be a higher class of priests and the chemists in our scientism's hierarchy. Yeah. So when they made those claims, they were raised up and then they were expelled. Mm -hmm. And to this day, the word cold fusion is used as a synonym for quackery. Mm -hmm. That's how you know that there is a lot of religiosity to the what we call science. And we know that now easily with virology and all of that. It's even more obvious now. But if you're a Christian, you could have picked up the religiosity of dogmatic views of science that are considered settled before you saw the flagrant example of it in the in the pandemic. You see what I mean? If you're a Christian, you're ahead of the game. You see, you don't have to wait till it's like flagrantly in your face. Oh, wow, there's religiosity in science. Ooh, you know, you, you could already be there if you were actually imitating Christ in the mindset he has with a hermeneutic of suspicion towards these given dogmas that we are surrounded by all around us. See, so it's just, yeah. it's fascinating to me. That's again, is another evidence of the superiority of this. Yeah. <laughs> it literally gives you an advantage and your society an advantage and you should use it very wisely and humbly and not exploit it. Right. Yeah. And this is what it means by saying that Christ defeated death. It's not just him resurrecting that once it's like this whole mindset. It's like defeating death across the universe on multiple layers of abstractions in everything. Yeah, so you defeating can cancer. Apply this mindset to everything. Yeah, yeah defeating cancer, defeating uh, poverty, defeating all of the things that we see. This is why I, I don't like reactionary ideology taking over Christianity because Christianity mm -hmm. is the real thing that liberal globalist culture is cheaply imitating. Yeah. So whenever you watch globalist uh, advertisements for companies, they'll talk about hope and saving the world and, you know, curing childhood diseases and get, eliminating poverty. Those are the claims that Christ set in motion. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to do a Christless rivalrous imitation of his project. Globalism is another word for universal, like the Catholic Church, you, 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 the universal church. It is, a, it is an attempt to create a global counterfeit imitation of Christ, whether people know it or not. Mm -hmm. Right? But the answer to that is not to retreat back into history like the reactionary traditionalist Christians, but to, to take up the imitation of Christ, which supplants the cheap imitation of globalism and liberalism. Yeah. To go beyond what they do, not to retreat it. They, the, the reaction radical, the rea the radical reactionaries and the traditionalists and all these people who are trying to take Christianity, they take it and try to make it like a museum piece that shows the superiority of the past. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Absolutely pagan and ridiculous. It doesn't mean you hate the past, but the idea that Christianity is about helping us remember that the past was better than the future. Are you kidding me? That's the opposite of Christianity. Jesus' first miracle makes the best wine at the end of history, not at the beginning of the wedding. Mm -hmm. That's that's why that's that's why that that's why he did that. 
You know why mm -hmm. he did that miracle in Cana? It was to show that he is orienting history in a different direction because it's in a wedding. All of history up until that point was designed based on the drama of a tragedy where the best mm -hmm. times were the golden years in the beginning and everything's kind of to get back to that golden years, right? And Jesus' first miracle is in a wedding, which is how comedies traditionally end. They end in a wedding. Mm -hmm. So Jesus' first miracle shows that the best tasting wine he brings out at the end of the wedding, not at the beginning, mm -hmm. right? And it's that transmutation that we are being signs of in our life, that we point people to the future. We, You have an opportunity, and I have an opportunity to be like time travelers in the way we act. We have the opportunity to forgive radically right now as a sign of how humans will be more like in a hundred years from now. Isn't that amazing? You get to literally imbue mimetically how people hundred years from now will act. You get to actually go ahead and do it now and make that process happen in 50 years rather than a hundred years. If you do it well, see what I mean? That's yeah. so beautiful about the way Christianity works. It's the religion of the future today. Yeah. And to the extent that we practice it beautifully, it accelerates that future, that future harvest happening sooner. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. Like if you forgive two people that really hurt you in your life, that's okay. You're modeling radical future orientation of how all humanity will be on earth when Christ is all in all. Mm -hmm. But if you forgive a hundred people, or if you forgive that person who hurts you more than anybody you can imagine, you are in in a sense you are living out the future at an accelerated rate than you could if you just hold back a little bit of your Christ like power mm -hmm. that you can be like you see what i mean so it's yeah. up to us it's radically up to us how we want to roll history out that's what Christ, that's what god is giving us the opportunity yeah. to do isn't that amazing like if we yeah. hold if we hedge our bets and we say the more we hedge our bets the more we're going to slow the process of the knowledge of the Lord spreading across the world. It'll still spread because he he can go past us whenever he wants. But the way in which it, you know, it's just obvious. If you change your town right, right now and totally put your full spirit into share, sharing a culture of grace and mercy and radical love and radical forgiveness and radical excellence and radical virtue, you can make such an incredible contagion of positive mimetic behavior that it will set forth in motion accelerating effects of, of, of abundant life in your own community, which will reverberate around the world because of how interconnected the whole world is now. Mm -hmm. The media technology. Yeah. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like what would happen, you know, if Joe Biden were to say, you know what, I had an epiphany, I had an encounter with God, and I got my life right, and I realized I can't go on with this lie, guys. They've they've cooked up all these indictments against Trump. I'm letting, I'm putting, I'm shutting them all down, and I'm apologizing. What would happen? Mm. Right? What would that do for the world? What would that do for the world, and how other leaders would be imitating that in their relation to their rivals right now? Mm -hmm. So we act like change in that way is so far away, but it's actually so close. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? It takes like one person and certain things could just unfold yeah. this mimetic. That's, that's the gospel, right? And also the that one story about the stoning of that woman, right? The let he who is without sin cast the first stone, right? That's I was reading that in uh I see Satan fall like lightning and Gerard's analysis is that, yeah, the hardest job is the person who casts the first stone or the person who chooses not to cast the first stone. Because the mimesis goes both ways. If you are the person who chooses not to cast that first stone, everyone else also mimics you in that direction. Right. right. See, so how many people could Trump or Tucker Carlson, you know, I'm, I'm using these names that we all know, but you could go anywhere, you know, it could be a guy yeah. who's prominent in your city, wherever you live, or it could be a person prominent in your church. And the reason why I say prominent is typically the more you are esteemed as a role model, the more people will emulate what you're mm -hmm. doing. Right. And you can yeah. choose on a dime to just change your whole attitude and your whole disposition towards those who hate you. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that's, that's why, you know, um, 
Paul says, you know, that Jesus told him, you know, Paul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And the language he's using is that of the way in which an ox was was uh, saddled to a, a chariot of, at its time. You couldn't pick it, the ox kicked against the pricks. You could not escape the yoke of the chariot that the ox was pulling. So it's basically he's saying you can run, but you can't hide, Paul. You can you can try to push, and why do you kick against the pricks? Because you can't escape me, <laughs> you know. And that's kind of the message that we all have to think about right now, you know, is how to you can you cannot run from the yoke of Christ's elevation of the human person. That goes for Israel. That goes for Palestinians. That goes for Islam. That goes for America. That goes for every little collective identity. It cannot run. Yeah, it will. It cannot escape the grasp of Christ's new system, new reality, right? Which is the elevation of love and mutual forgiveness and uh, and uh, peace. All right, that's been great talking to you. I, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, definitely, like one of the most profound conversations I've ever had. I think this time we finally found something special. Yeah, yeah, I've really enjoyed this. So I want people to follow you at Return to Mimetic on Twitter if they want to keep up with your posts. And mm -hmm. uh, we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Yep, thank you. And email me if you want to email me, hello at a neighborschoice.com. That's hello at a neighborschoice.com. I'm David Gronoski. Godspeed. <laughs>